Is Soccer Kid still good? Soccer Kid is a platformer developed by Chrysalis Software and released on the Amiga back in 1993. Over the following decade, it would be ported to a plethora of consoles, including but not limited to the Super Nintendo, CD32, Atari Jaguar, Game Boy Advance, and Sony PlayStation. Curiously, it never made it to the Genesis or Mega Drive, but today we'll be focusing on the 3DO port, released in 1994. And as you would expect from a game ported to just about everything, Soccer Kid was met with positive reviews. Electronic Gaming Monthly scored the game a 6.2 out of 10, stating, Soccer Kid has to be the first side-scrolling game where you use the ball as a weapon. Loaded with technique, this game has excellent graphics, but the sound effects could be punched up a little. GamePro gave the game an 8 out of 10, noting, With the cartoon segments and the idea of a kid hero, this is geared towards younger gamers, but older players might have fun as well. If you're looking for a decent challenge with cool animation and fun gameplay, Soccer Kid scores. Finally, Video Games and Computer Entertainment scored the game a 9 out of 10, proclaiming, Soccer Kid is a fabulously fun platform game with lots of action. So is Soccer Kid still this good? Let's take a look. As one would expect from a CD title released in 1994, Soccer Kid for the 3DO opens with an FMV cutscene. The narrator explains how Soccer Kid is excited for the big game about to begin. Then the camera jumps to a spaceship, which happens to house four trophies with room for one more. The alien craft then hovers over the football pitch and snags a fifth cup for the collection. While escaping the Earth's gravitational pull, the alien ship crashes into an orbiting satellite causing the newly acquired trophy to smash into five pieces and then fall to the earth. The news stations happen to catch all of this on film, as pieces smash into England, Japan, Italy, Russia, and the United States. Soccer Kid sees this and feels inspired to go capture the five trophy pieces. Soccer Kid begins his adventure in England. With one exception, which I'll get to later, each country is divided into six distinct levels. So, in England, Soccer Kid makes his way through two levels in Sunnyside Zone, two levels of Rural England, and then two levels in London Zone. The sixth level concludes with a boss fight. But backing up a bit, let's talk about the controls. Soccer Kid's basic moveset is running and jumping. He picks up momentum quickly with the high top speed but can also change directions quickly. It feels tight and responsive, and I have no real complaints. The jumping is a bit less refined. Soccer Kid feels like he is on a predetermined arc, and the player must let go of the D-pad to get him to fall downward. It feels a bit stiff, and despite spending over 8 hours with the game, the jumping never became natural, always feeling somewhat imprecise. Still, it isn't awful or anything, just not as fluid as some of the best third-party titles of the day. Of course, the main gimmick of Soccer Kid is the soccer ball. This is the weapon of the game, and Soccer Kid cannot jump on enemies. The soccer ball itself is both easy to use and somewhat complex. At first, you'll just kick it forward to hit the threat directly on Soccer Kid's path. But as you venture on, you'll discover you can juggle the ball with the legs or head and perform more ranged and precise kicks. This can be useful for hitting enemies or nabbing items. There are special kicks as well, such as a header and bicycle kick. In fact, Soccer Kid has so many different maneuvers, three pages in the game's manual are dedicated to explaining how everything works. Finally, the ball can be used as a super jump, and Soccer Kid can dive underneath low walls. It's all a bit overwhelming at first, as almost everything requires multiple buttons or specific timing. While the learning curve is a bit odd, ball movement is responsive and predictable, and it does become second nature after a while. Also scattered about the levels are various items. Hidden away are treasure chests containing health, extra lives, and two flavors of invincibility, one which grants additional speed. Besides the chests are plenty of different food items rewarding points and cards. Each pair of levels contains 11 cards to collect. An information item at the beginning of the level informs the player how many cards can be found in the level. If you discover you don't have all of the cards when you reach the end of the level, you can backtrack to find what you are missing. The cards are to Soccer Kid what Chaos Emeralds are to Sonic. If all 11 cards in a pair of levels are collected, a bonus stage is presented. If the player 
collects all of the items in the bonus level before time runs out, they are rewarded with a piece of the Soccer Cup Trophy. Presumably, the player has three chances to collect the Soccer Cup Trophy piece in each of the five countries. With the trophy piece rescued and a boss defeated, Soccer Kid makes his way to Italy. The three areas here are Italian Runes, Venice, and Italian Riviera. Despite being just the second country of five, this also contains the most difficult areas in the entire game, and it reminds me of the infamous The Lion King. What makes these areas so challenging are moving, rotating platforms. I mentioned the jumping felt stiff and imprecise, and it becomes a real problem here. Missing this platform, for example, Land Soccer Kid in a pit of spikes, killing the player. In Venice, Soccer Kid must make his way across boats, as landing in water instantly kills him. To make matters worse are jumping fish. You can try to memorize the patterns and time your jumps, but failing results in collisions with the enemies, and Soccer Kid contains knockback, meaning enemy collisions can lead to being knocked into the water to death. For the remainder of the game, anytime I found myself in this situation, I always painstakingly timed attacks with the soccer ball to assure an unobstructed path to the other side. There are also barrels which race at the player from the right side of the screen, without warning. Eventually, one will learn to just expect it when there is a large slope, but I often found myself failing to jump while preoccupied with the soccer ball, controlled with a different button. Finally, there are the bosses. The first boss is a rugby player, I think. All the player needs to do is attack, then jump over the boss as he moves to the other side of the screen. Repeat the process a few times and he'll quickly go down. The second boss is an opera singer. His first attack is sound notes, which are fired at Soccer Kid. As they home in on Soccer Kid quickly, the player must already know the pattern ahead of time as everything happens so fast. Normal platforming reflexes won't be enough to be successful. You'll also see I have zero remaining lives, which means when I fail, I receive a game over. Thankfully, Soccer Kid does feature a save system. Unfortunately, saving is only an option after defeating a boss. This means after receiving a game over and loading my save file, I'm taken back to the beginning of Italy and have to replay a whopping six levels all over again, representing about half an hour of gameplay through the most difficult platforming found in the game. Only then does the player have a chance to retry the boss. With Italy's difficulty spike out of the way, Soccer Kid makes his way to Russia, through the Siberian forest, across a Russian battleship, and finally to Red Square. It is here where I found a new type of item, the Red Heart. This adds a third heart to the life bar, though this is sadly as far as the life bar can be expanded. After finding a second one in another area, nothing happened, even though it appears there is room for another one. Other than the final item, everything in Russia is exactly the same as has been presented thus far. In England, there were underground areas to travel to, and these existed in Italy, and they are again found in Russia. Sometimes you have to use dynamite to blow up the entrance or locate a secret path, but they function the same. Instead of bricks falling from the sky or coconuts from a tree, there are icicles. And instead of wine barrels racing down a hill, it's a kid on a sled. Other than some changed set dressings, the level structure is remarkable remarkably familiar. Same goes for the third boss. This gymnast moves left and right across the screen, and the player just needs to jump over her and kick the ball. Because the gymnast doesn't have any projectile attacks, it ends up being the easiest boss in the game. After Russia, Soccer Kid arrives in Japan, over the rice fields, across a bullet train, and through Tanaka Custom Hardware, a factory of sorts. The rice fields don't offer much new. The same collapsing platforms, basic enemy patterns, and overhead birds featured thus far are repeated yet again. Even the underground tunnels are remarkably similar, and unless my eyes are deceiving me, the rock patterns found here are just palette swapped versions of those in Russia. The level very much has a been there, done that feel to it. The only thing new are these obnoxious bugs. They follow an erratic pattern, meaning it can be tough to hit them. I found bouncing the ball off Soccer Kid's head and then waiting for them to dive close was the only way to reliably dispatch them. While I am glad there are new enemy patterns requiring the player to utilize different moves, I can't say this makes for engaging gameplay. This changes on the bullet train. This is a one-off level, and the only time an area isn't presented as a pair. This is also how we arrive at 29 levels instead of 30. 
While I've grumbled about the level structure being essentially the same up to this point, the bullet train feels vastly different. For one, Soccer Kid moves from right to left, and second, there are no underground sections or sky areas to explore. These are minor for sure, but the fact the structure is different is a breath of fresh air. Next, the first set of enemies requires actual timing in order to not get hit by the coal, the moles are checking. And while I don't really like the jumping in Soccer Kid, the platforms are so large it isn't an issue. It's just a neat change of pace to actually worry about enemy timing. After this, Soccer Kid must duck when the icon appears on the screen to avoid getting hit by the trackside signs. While not groundbreaking, it was fun to finally be doing something different. The two factory levels follow suit. The player must dodge fireballs, electric lines, all while navigating along horizontal and vertical conveyor belts, while trying to not get crushed. While the levels are still linear, there are plenty of nooks and crannies to find bonus points, cards, and power-ups, helping the level to feel a lot larger than it really is. The new stage hazards work well with the precise running mechanics. Unfortunately, the awkward boss battle returns. Here, a sumo wrestler wanders back and forth, but after he lands a jump, his massive size knocks items from the shelves at the top of the screen. Despite multiple playthroughs, I can honestly say I never really got into a rhythm with this guy. Instead, I just spammed attacks as fast as I could and hoped to win the War of Attrition. And from here, Soccer Kid crosses the Pacific and arrives in the United States, first in the Wild West, then on to Florida, before arriving in New York City. Sadly, all of the gameplay progression found in Japan is completely forgotten here. Wild West has some indestructible tumbleweeds, but it could just as well be any other outdoor area. Same goes for Florida, with predictable enemies on specific slopes and tricky platforms moving over deadly water. Finally, New York City feels just like the first level in the game. There is one area where you need to kick the ball into the air and then move out of the way so it can destroy some bricks, and you can kick the soccer ball through a basketball hoop for 10 points. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but this is level 29, and at two and a half hours in, I found myself a little tired of the recycled gameplay. This leads us to the boss of the US, an American footballer. Par for the course, this guy moves back and forth across the screen. However, his attacks are pretty brutal and will require memorization. You need to jump before he throws the ball, as it moves so fast it will hit Soccer Kid without being proactive. Next, you have to jump over him perfectly when he rushes to the right side of the screen. You see, he actually spikes the ball, and there are just a few frames where Soccer Kid can run underneath it. Without already knowing to jump before he throws, and to time your leap over him perfect to avoid the spiked football, the player will take three or four hits rather quickly, resulting in a game over. And yeah, this means racing through six levels all over again for another chance at glory. Now, this is normally where I would have a spoiler alert to not ruin the ending, but I never made it to the final final boss to see the good ending. Instead, after clearing the 29 stages and defeating the five bosses, an FM the cutscene is shown, where the alien actually rubs it in Soccer Kid's face, he has the Soccer Cup trophy, shoots a winning goal, and then beams himself back into space. The narrator announces there must be a way for Soccer Kid to save the day, and the game comes to an unsatisfying conclusion. So, what did I miss, you might ask? Well, I only retrieved one of the five pieces of the Soccer Cup trophy. In Italy, Russia, Japan, and the US, I never located all 11 cards in a pair of levels to get a crack at the bonus level to earn another piece. The first reason is because of the birds. Throughout the levels, Soccer Kid will often need to perform a blind jump to reach a higher platform, but you can bet there is probably a bird cycling back and forth up there. If there wasn't knockback, maybe it would be more tolerable, but it's hard justifying exploring in some areas knowing a game over will start you back at the beginning of a country. And don't even get me started on the collapsible platforms, giving you the wonderful choice between falling to the ground losing progress or jumping into a bird and taking damage. And if you only have a life or two left and haven't mastered a boss pattern yet, it makes it even less appealing to try and risk lives to collect the 11 cards. All of this could be alleviated if one could revisit previous levels. A simple world map or even a text-based level select screen to revisit previous areas would be an awesome way to at least let the 
the player clear a stage and restart the level with all of the health packs restored to give it another go. Instead, you have to achieve perfection on a single playthrough. If you do, there is a final boss fight against the alien and a good ending. Sadly, I had to put the controller down after 8 hours and move on to the next phase of this review. Graphically, Soccer Kid feels unique on the 3DO. It doesn't push the hardware like Gex, however what it does do is run at a rock solid 60 frames per second from beginning to end. Additionally, there are many 16-bit staples here, like multiple layers of parallax scrolling, dithering used for car windows and water, and 60Hz flicker faking transparencies. There is a transparency effect found on the opera singer boss mimicking a spotlight, and I really wish this would have carried over into more of the game. I do like how both Soccer Kid and the Soccer Ball will get lighter and darker depending on the light conditions of the area though. When underground, both will be dark. When in the bright sun, both will be light. The street lights in New York City even illuminate Soccer Kid as he walks past. A nice touch. I also enjoy the overall art direction. Backgrounds are detailed, set pieces like large cars and pagodas look great, and the enemies are large and detailed. I will say the actual terrain often feels basic with fast stretches of tiles, sometimes not even lining up properly. But as a whole, I find Soccer Kid to be a visually appealing game. The audio is nice as well. The background music does a decent job fitting the country Soccer Kid is in, with the appropriate Japanese sounds in Japan, Western music in the Old West, and military-style tracks in Russia. But for every great track, there is an equally unimpressive one. Half the soundtrack sounds like generic 90s filler, like the stuff you would hear in a 90s infomercial. The stark contrast in quality can be somewhat jarring. At times, it's easy to get sucked into the world. Other times, the generic music matches the generic level design. Thankfully, the sound effects are all fine. Soccer Kid has an unobtrusive jumping sound and the soccer ball makes a satisfying thwack when impacting enemies. Some of the human foes even have voice samples play when they arrive on the screen. Even the narrator on the FMV cutscene sounds great. Still, the music as a whole definitely fails in comparison to the awesome tracks composers like Tommy Tellerico or Spencer Nelson were creating for their respective companies. So, with all of that out of the way, we arrive back to the question asked at the beginning of the video. Is Soccer Kid still good? First, let's take a look at the positive aspects of Soccer Kid. The controls are responsive, specifically the moving. Soccer Kid feels agile, and I never really found myself running into enemies or hazards. And while I found the jumping a bit lackluster, the collision detection is perfect, and I never fell through platforms or other such nonsense. Next, I really like the overall concept. The soccer ball is a great weapon, and while the plethora of moves are overwhelming at first, it did feel natural after giving it some proper time. Another aspect I really enjoyed were the bonus points awarded for not losing your ball. At the end of each stage, points are rewarded for the cards collected, the trick shots performed, and also for how many balls weren't used. The goal is presented on the opening item, letting you know the ball goal. 100 points are rewarded for each ball under the goal the player is. This meant I would often do a header or other maneuver to keep my ball moving forward. At times, however, you will be forced to respawn the soccer ball. If you do this too many times, you'll fail the goal and not receive any points. It's subtle for sure, but adds some depth to both the gameplay and the scoring. So, with the responsive controls, unique gimmick, and nice scoring system, I can come to no other conclusion than Soccer Kid is definitely a good game. However, the game is showing its age, and I have three main issues. First, the level design is bland and uninspired. Just about every level follows the same exact structure. A main path from left to right, underground areas, be it sewers, caves, or subway, and above ground areas, like trees, buildings, or hay bales. Sadly, they all function the same. While there is an occasional unique element presented now and again, the level design is basic at best and repeats for 29 grueling levels. I enjoy the vast array of set pieces, don't get me wrong, I just wish the gaming experience matched the visual variety. Next, the bosses suck. 
All five end of the country bosses feature similar patterns, utilize trial and error as a means of difficulty, and must be defeated with pure memorization, as they move too fast for normal reaction times. I'm not saying these are controller throwing frustration fests, but they aren't engaging either. Finally, things start to break down when going for a completion run. The bird enemies in the sky are way too easy to jump into, and venturing towards the tops of the maps is required to nab the 11 cards needed to unlock the bonus levels, which rewards the trophy pieces needed for a good ending. To make matters worse, it is not possible to revisit past levels. If you are out of hit points, you simply can't risk going for the cards, as the game over screen spawns the player at the beginning of the country, rather than the beginning of the level or area. Granted, this is a purely optional goal, but I really wanted to see the final final boss and see the good ending, but the design decisions didn't allow me the luxury. So, I can't in good conscience call this a great game like the reviewers of the 90s, but I still like it. What Soccer Kid lacks in technical achievements, it makes up for with charm. I love the 90s European art style, with square circles and rectangles making up nearly every set piece. I also enjoy the basic textures and abundance of gradients. Something about the overall art direction just screams Amiga, and I find it quite appealing. Next, the game features no violence whatsoever. After defeating an enemy, they leap off the screen, rather than die or flicker away. It's a subtle touch, and I don't have any problems with video game violence, but I find enemies jumping into the water, leaving a splash as they exit the screen to be oddly amusing. Lastly, the game commits few sins. It's like to camp attack in a way. Sure, there is little substance setting it apart from most platformers, but there isn't anything here to frustrate or annoy anyone. Bubsy, this is not. This also happens to be a cheap 3DO game, and if you're looking for something to play which won't break the bank, Soccer Kid is worth a look.